Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Troubadour Talks. Today, we got a special episode for you because we're going to be talking about movies, popular culture, and a wonderful short story by Guy de Maupassant called Bull de Suif. And that's my American accent. I'm sure there's another way of pronouncing it. And to talk about all this stuff, since we're going to be doing movies as well, I brought on Chris DePredis in California. He's a director. And you just had your, what is that? You've produced a couple, and this is your first directorial and production debut. It's uh, Death Blood 4, available on Prime. And um, it's not, you don't have to watch Death Blood 1, 2, or 3, although you could search for them if you want. Um, it's standalone, Death Blood 4. But why don't you tell us a little bit about Death Blood 4. For any social media, you could uh, find it at Death Blood 4, um, his, his uh, debut, directorial debut. So why don't you tell us about that before we get rolling? Cool. Yeah, thanks, Kirk, and thanks for having, having me on the podcast. Uh, so Death Blood 4 is the first movie that I've directed. It's a, it's a micro-budget film, which um, I... I uh, think is important to to point out so um uh we did what what we could with the resources that we had but uh it's a 90 minute kind of ode to uh 80s horror and adventure and and uh sci-fi kind of stuff um and certainly a fun learning experience um, for me and the rest of the cast and crew. So that is up on uh, Amazon Prime. It's been up for about six months. But what what's the the story? So people go should go see this. What are they going to get if they go to sure. Prime? It's it's pretty affordable on Prime, right? Just a couple bucks, I think. Yeah, it's it's uh, you could rent it for for two or three dollars if you're yeah. a Prime subscriber. It's free. There you um, go. And and you know basically the premise is that and, and keep in mind that we. Uh, this whole thing before the pandemic happened. Oh, uh, that's right. I had no idea that that would take place, but <laughs> so you say. Yeah, that's right. But uh, but basically, um, you know, the movie is about a um, a blood virus that uh, you know gets into a town, and it's actually caused you know intentionally by this scientist and this police officer because they can use the virus to control the town. And um, and luck, but luckily there is this sort of legacy character who um, has the lifeblood <laughs> in her veins, and and uh, you know she, with the help of uh, an alien from outer space and her friend and this talking TV and and her roommate, are able to uh, uh, try to go out and fight the death blood, which which involves fighting a crazed killer and a corrupt police officer and Bigfoot. And all of it takes place <laughs> in a small town, Pleasanton, California. So you have to watch to see if they're able to succeed and rid the world of the death blood. Um, it was weird. Uh, you know, we, we, we finished it um, September 19, but then we put it on Prime uh, in July of 2020. So it Woo! was definitely mid-pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And, I did not make that connection. I don't well, know why. It, it is kind of weird with that con because it kind of feels like we got inspired by coronavirus and then made this movie. Yeah. Um, but we didn't. So, <laughs> yeah, it's out there. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, go check out at Death Blood 4 on all social media or go or preferably go and rend. Or if you're a Prime subscriber, watch Death Blood 4. It's a throwback to those uh, 80s, those 80s sci fi horror weird movies that were made. And there is no one, two, or three. That's the joke. It's part of it, just so everybody knows. I was kidding earlier. Okay, so, but you're also, Chris is also the leader and the creator of the film um, clubs that I'm a part of, kind of. I'm in Austin now, but when I was living in, um, I was living in Livermore, which is right next to Pleasanton in Northern California just recently. And that's how I met Chris, is he does several film clubs uh, in the area. And so we're always talking about great films and Today, we're going to talk about the short story, Bull de Suif, and possibly a little bit the short story, Stage to Lordberg by Haycox, and, um, but uh, really want to focus a lot on Stagecoach, actually, a movie and their relations. And one of the things I was hoping we could talk about is how um, directors you know, can take literary products and transform them, and the different interpretive abilities of a, you know, of a director and, and the, you know, creating these 
these stories. But for you, the listener, today, what I hope you're going to get out of this is one, enjoying some good art. So Bold Sweep is a great short story that everybody should read. I mean, it's, it's just wonderful. And, um, you know, the same thing with Stagecoach. Stagecoach is a great story. It's, you know, well told. And it's one of the most, it's arguably one of the most influential movies in cinema history, I would say. And we could debate that, but we could talk about that more. So let's jump into um, a synopsis briefly. I like to do this off the top of my head because um, it's imperfect, but I recommend people do this after they read short stories or any or any story because it helps you to solidify it in your mind. It's something that I didn't do in the past, and so I've forgotten like a lot of stories that I've read in the past. So Bull to Sweep, um, it's not going to be a perfect summary. You can find better ones online, but I think this might be interesting for you guys to listen to this process of summarizing. And Basically, it happens um, toward, it takes place toward the end of the Franco-Prussian War. That, by the way, is not important, really. The, the war itself, you don't need to know the history to that, which is really nice to know. You don't have to have it be a history buff. It's really good at the characters. But anyway, so it starts at the Franco, the end of the Franco-Prussian War. A whole bunch of French soldiers are, are um, leaving um, this town, Rouen. So the town, the French town, is going is being taken over by German or Prussian uh, soldiers. The meat of the story is a group of I think it's nine passengers get on a carriage, um, or stagecoach in a sense, uh, not a stagecoach because that's for mail, but a carriage um, out of Rouen into a. Um, in, they're going to another city and they're going to a French city that's still in control by French. And I can't remember the name of the city. Do you remember the name of the city, Chris? Any chance? Uh, I know that they start. I don't know how to pronounce any of the names. Yeah. The names I'm all done with. (laughs) Um, I actually looked it up on the map because it's easier for me to kind of visualize it. If I know the, I know they stop in Tetez. Um, and then, um, uh, Let's see. They are actually try. Don't remember where they're actually trying to go. Okay, that's um, all right. Um, maybe it's Havre or however you say that. Oh, it might be ha- uh, La Havre. Yeah, I think you're correct. That sounds right. Yeah. Um, was that? Yeah, yeah, that might be. But I don't know. If not, not a big deal. It's, I don't even think the city names are that critical to the story. They're really background, so don't worry about it. Um, but anyway, so they go on this journey. Um, there's. It's with, I don't want to go into the details of all the characters. That's a lot of the fun of the story, and we'll talk about it as we go. But there are nine characters that I think represent various um, societal um, types, like the, the count, the rich merchant, the um, church person, and then, there, and then there's a Democrat. Um, and this is not American Democrat. It's very, this is French Democrat, so uh, anti-royalist, I think, was his view. And then um, a, a prostitute are the main characters in that. They're traveling. Everyone has forgotten um, food, and except for Bull de Suif, the prostitute. And she um, offers it to everybody very willingly. Then they get to this inn. A German officer comes over, tells them that they are... Um, um, well, I don't remember. What is he? Do you remember what the German officer says to them when he first gets there? When they first arrive in the inn at the hotel, the inn. I don't remember what he says when they first get there. I mean, the, there's a they make a big point at demonstrating um, how they react to him. It seems yeah. because uh, because most of the um, characters are, you know, uh, you know, more or less against the war and aren't super pro German soldier. Um, but mm-hmm. well, that's saying a lot because they're all French. They're all French. So they don't like, they don't like that they're being conquered for sure. They don't, but <laughs> Boulder Sweep seems the most yeah. out by it. Whereas that's very important. Um, some of the other, uh, folks, particularly the there's, there's three couples who, who make up six of the, of the people. Um, and those three couples have, you know, kind of a various degrees of wealth. Mm-hmm. But where they all kind of seem to to match a little bit is that they would take they would prefer their comfort almost over their principles. over their principles. Yeah. Does that, does that seem true? 
Yeah, and I think um, so. I have a list of the characters, and it might be helpful just uh, even in a, in a minute to go through them briefly um, yeah. to the best of our abilities and see what we can come up with. But yeah, so I, I think, but I think you're right. The the core of it is that besides Cornu Day, the Democrat, and he's an inter- he's probably one of the other more interesting characters, and Bull de Suif, everyone else pretends in public to be very virtuous and, and pro French, but in private, they are very um, obsequious to these conquering people because it, it's better for their, um, their pleasantry to, you know, why, you know, why disturb, why poke the bear really, if these are the people who are now in control of our lives when we could still live good, happy lives. And, and there's, yeah. So that, that's a, yeah. I think that's the deck. What were you going to say? I, I totally agree. They they seem to to feel they don't really care who's in charge so long as they're comfortable. Yes, right? and or at least they say they seem to not care, and that's what's um that's what's an interesting thing about the levels of society. So they get to this inn, a, a hotel, you know, eighteenth century or seventh nineteenth century hotel, an inn, and um, a German officer hits on or says that he will not let them leave if Bolda Swift does not sleep with him. And so the then the the then all the, the other passengers try to persuade her. Eventually they do. She sleeps with the officer um, and then they go on their way. And then they the other passengers snub Bolda Swift and don't give her the food that she did at the beginning. This is a short story. It's only like 25 pages, but there's a lot. The plot is really basic. That's basically the plot. They leave there's no there's food given by Bolda Sweef, stopped by the German officer. Then they're uh, at at the inn. The officer doesn't let them escape. He's not going to let them keep going on their journey unless Bolda Sweef goes and sleeps with them. Um, eventually, she says no. The other passengers eventually um, persuade her to do so. On the way home or on the way continuing, Bolda Sweef has not had the time to get food for herself. The other passengers have. They do not share the food with her, and then it basically ends. Those are the major plot elements. I don't think the spoiling issue is a big deal here because what's really critical with Guy de Maupassant and the story are the descriptions, and it's the the meaning of it. it. The descriptions are beautiful. They're so good, and it's worth reading. And I'll we'll maybe pick out a couple of passages here and there, but. It's worth reading, not because the plot is so insane and there's twists and turns, but because the descriptions are so great. Every one of them, the way he describes Cornudet, I mean, one of the great lines in literature, you know, he loved his ale, his pale ale and pale revolution, right? And that, that's the description of Cornudet um, and the kind of person he's described as this rowdy Democrat who's all about revolution, 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 but only with... You know, only at the tankard, only with the beer. He's not the guy that pulls the trigger. He's not a warrior. He, um, you know, is described as he builds the, or he, he like makes little trenches to get in their way when the army is, the German army is approaching Rouen. But then he runs away, right? He doesn't fight them. He just like puts little booby traps and then gets out of there. So he never confronts really. He just talks, talks, talks for the most part. Um, so anyway, that that's Bull de Suif. Now maybe we can go through the characters really briefly for everybody, and as we do that, we could talk about the story. Unless there's something else you like to talk about first. No, I think uh, I, the characters are what make it. So um, I think you cover the plot points well, but it's interesting how brutal the the book, how how brutal the story feels by the time you reach the end of it. Yes, even though that's the even though that is what the plot is. It just feels it's kind of it's kind of taken out of you when you get to the end of it because you do care about these. Well, at least you care about her, Bull de Suif. Yeah. And um, and the descriptions feel very I think the reason that the, that the descriptions kind of hit so hard is because they feel very true. They feel very well. You, I'm sorry, you broke up. They feel very true. Mm, what yeah. he's writing feels familiar, even if it was written 150 years ago. And, um, and it feels like it can, I mean, it's no wonder that it's translated into stories later on, as we're going to discuss with stagecoach, but you could very easily translate this into a story 
taking place today. You might have to swap the professions and or or or, or you know whatnot of some of the characters, but um, but the way the humans treat each other is the way people continue to treat each other, unfortunately. Yeah, and we, I mean we could talk about that because that's one of the questions in all of these stories. I think that we're going to be looking at, or at least Stagecoach and Bull de Suif. You know, to some degree, Bull de Suif is about you know, what you, how different elements of society or a criticism of how different elements of society acted or, or do act in a occupation of this sort. Right. And, um, so there are, because the, this kind of occupation, what I think is the Franco Prussian war in particular is very different than what might be in our imaginations of like world war two where world war two sure. was Nazis and it was, they were much more, brutal in a lot of ways the this is pre all that and basically you know the leader of the prussian um you know the leader of the prussians i don't know his name but he's you know he's basically like the cousin of the leader of the franks right and the french and th there's basically just vying over who's going to control what area so they you know they, there's killing and they'll you know go in and they'll kill some people but then everything can kind of go back to normal a little bit but the question is, like, you know, do they have a fervor for their country? Um, and what does that mean? But I wanted to read, like, a just a few little subs uh, descriptions that I think are awesome. <laughs> so, like, the, there's a wine merchant. The wine merchant is um, uh, Mr. Lousseau, I believe. Is that the, yeah, yeah, that's the wine merchant, Mr. Lousseau. Um, formerly clerk to a merchant who had failed in business, Lousseau had brought his master's interest bought, excuse me, bought his master's interest and made a fortune for himself. He sold very bad wine at a very low price to the retail dealers in the country and had the reputation among his friends and acquaintances, this is friends and acquaintances, of being a shrewd rascal, a true Norman, uh, Norman, it's French, full of quips and wiles. I mean, those, you know, and it goes on, so well established was his character as a cheat that in the mouths of the citizens of Rouen, the very name of Lousseau, became a byword for sharp practice. And this is another interesting thing. If you, When you read this story, and I really recommend reading this story if you haven't already or reading it again, that you'll notice that each of these characters are leaving Rouen for a specific reason. Lousseau um, is leaving it. And, and now one broad way that all the wealthy people are leaving is essentially because um, there's other opportunities elsewhere. That's how Guy de Maupassant puts it, right? But I think there's other things like Lousseau is reading because he's cheated everybody in Rouen, right? Like everybody knows him. He's a cheat. Now it's time to go, right? Um, the the um, La Lamadin, the the cotton merchant, um, and yeah, they are traveling to um, Havre or Havre, and you know he's just trying to get better opportunities at Le Havre or whatever it is in, in this other town. Um, the count, a nobleman advanced in years and, uh, and of aristocratic bearing, strove to enhance by every artifice of the toilet his natural resemblance to King Henry IV. Um, it says toilet in here, but it's toilet. It's like what that's a French term for, you know, makeup essentially and, and making yourself up. But anyway, so the count, you know, it's like this whole lineage of he maybe comes from King Henry the Fourth because like his mother or some ancestor might have slept with someone he might actually, but they don't really, you know, it's this weird thing. But again, that what makes the story so wonderful are the keen observations of these types of characters. Now, you may not know um, someone exactly like Lousseau, but I, you probably do know that kind of you know, shrewd cheat of a merchant in real life. You might not know a count, but you probably know someone who's very, um, you know, into their heritage or, the, you know, they're into their looks a lot in this case. And that's, I think, one of the, the interesting things about these types of descriptions. Um, okay, last one I want to do real quick is the introduction to Bull de Suif, our main character, who is, I just, she is a wonderful character. You really need to read this story. The woman who belonged to the courtesan class was distinguished for an um, embun point. I don't know what that word means, actually. Unusual for her age, which had earned for her the sabruquet of Bull de Suif. 
short and round, fat as a pig, with puffy fingers constricted at the joints, looking like rows of short sausages, and with a shiny, tightly stretched skin and an enormous bust feeling out the bodice of her dress, she was yet attracted, attractive and much sought after. And it goes on. I also did not uh, know the word uh, "ambun point," so yeah. I, I I wrote it in here, and it's plump, but okay. specifically, but specifically um, with breasts, perhaps. Got it. So, which <laughs> yeah, uh, so it, it encapsulates the character in a way, or how they see the character anyway, right? How they see the character. Now, I do want to say that if you Google and look up images, she's, you know, I think it can be easy to assume that she's like obese. But she's plump and, and you know, in, for, in this term, in the right places and in the right way. But at the same time, it's not like, I think it's interesting to think of her as a sexual being because that's what Guy de Maupassant's really trying to stress. The French did have a little bit different view of what is the ideal sexual being, especially Guy. And um, so it's interesting, that, you know, she's not like a, a super skinny American 21st century you know, model, like she's got some beef to her, but they like that. She's got, she's, uh, you know, got a little bit of substance to her and, right. and, you know, Guy has some really great descriptions of, of this stuff that I, uh, of this kind that I think are worth reading. Um, okay. So that, so that's the, the basic, those are the, the, I guess the main characters there's, um, let, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Lamont, Lamodon, Kerry Lamadan, I don't know how to pronounce it. These guys are just um, it's husband and wife. She, the wife, is basically you know described as a, a prize for being bourgeois. He's this is just a general. He's a merchant, cotton merchant. He's a general um, bourgeois character. There's the Brevilles, who I think are the wealthiest among the travelers, and. Um, right, those are the counts. Those, oh, those, yeah, those are the counts. Thing, and then there's Cornudet. That's the the interesting one to me. It's Cornudet. There's Count and Countess. Yeah, that's right. And then the oh, two no, oh, I, the two nuns. Yeah. yeah, two nuns. They have very small amounts of stuff. They're described a lot, and they are. There's a lot of irony and sarcasm in Guy about them. I don't know if you picked up on that. Um, sure. But especially with the nuns, he is not pro church, at least. At least he doesn't come across that way in the thing. Because, like, for instance, he'll say something like, you know, the nuns um, come, you know, they, they only appeared when there was food type thing. <laughs> right. So, right. yeah. He's certainly not pro church as it's, as it's represented by the nuns, right? Well, but I, yeah, but I, I think that they represent the church. So, right. So like he's not pro church because he's those nuns are drawn the way that because he could have drawn them differently, but they're also the ones who eventually are the final, uh, you know, hit on the nail on the head for convincing Bull de Suif to sleep with the um, the officer because they're the ones who basically make an argument of called causes tree or or um, that the the ends justify the means. Right. And that you'll be like your or no, your motivation. So it's your motivations that matter to God is what they say. And then she's so, you know, and we have to go save these sick kids. So you should have sex with this German officer. Right. Right. And it's like because they're because yeah. they're saving soldiers and so soldiers. Yeah. Every night that they are stuck at the inn, soldiers are. So they they essentially turn it into as long as you don't sleep with this officer. French soldiers are dying because we nuns can't go save them basically. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the nuns are very drawn, very hypocritically. Um, I don't remember the actual description of their face. I don't know if I marked it, but like one of them is like pock marked up. Like she had, she, she had smallpox. Yeah. She had smallpox. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that that's his attack, but the way he writes it, you know, if you look at that scene, is really interesting. And, and I think it's because it's, you know, it's like the pock marks are like the mark on her character or something like that. And it's, um, you know, you know, I don't know if you have that marked down, but I don't have that one marked down, but anyway, so it's that, those are the nuns <laughs> and yeah, they're not, you know, here's, here's the one I was talking about earlier. 
The nuns who appeared only at meals cast down their eyes and said nothing when there was food. And so they don't say much. They're just kind of there. They take yeah. what's given to them and it's kind of an expectation. And and then there's the German commander who demands of him. And I think he has one of the most important lines that is helpful in analyzing this story. And he says, so remember the story is the German commander tells, every, you know, um, tells the driver, you're not allowed to leave. And then um, the, the owner of the inn, you know, finally comes to the group of nine people and says, you can't go. Um, and he wa- the German officer wants to speak to Boulle de Suif. Right. And, you know, Boulle de Suif goes and talks to him and she finds out that he wants to sleep with her. And that's the reason that they can't go. So <clears throat> the German officer's line that he says is after, after a couple, like a day or two, the other passengers besides Boulle de Suif go to the German officer, go to the innkeeper and say, go tell this to the German officer that they want, they, they don't think it's fair that they are being held just because he wants to sleep with Bull de Suif. Just hold Bull de Suif, put her in prison, do whatever you want. Right. And the German officer's response is, I understand human nature. None of you can go until I get what I want. And it's right. that line of I understand human nature because what happens next is each of them in their own way persuades Bull de Suif and, and guilts her into it. Right. Now, why does Bull de Suif not want... She is a prostitute, by the way. I don't know if we mentioned that. She's a prostitute. Why does she not want to sleep with this German officer? It's, a, it's out of patriotism. Yeah, but what about in her character, like, do we know that is like, you know, why we know that she's like this? Like, she'll sleep with most anybody for money, right? She sleeps with the coachman, we learn. But she won't sleep with this guy to save all of them, you know, make make life easier for them. There's something, like, she has some actions that we learn. Like, why is she leaving Rouen? Let's put it that way. Oh, I don't remember why she leaves. Well, she has to leave because she's afraid of retribution because she attacked a German officer who's placed in her house. So oh, I think right. this goes now. Now we can start maybe talking about the broader themes of this uh, story, because um, there's a difference. It's drawn very early in the story that there's a difference in this occupied Rouen between um, private and public appearances with certain characters so some people like the um you know the countess and lasso and lamadon uh, lamadon that the the cotton merchant that they um in private at in their own home by their own hearth their fireplace are very cordial to the german officers who are being put in or the german soldiers who are being put into their house because right. Why mess with them, right? Like, what's the point of messing with them? What's why should we do this? Just, just get along, you know, get along to get along, or whatever it is. Sir. Now, there is a, a moment early on when we learn that there are some people in this area who are not like this, right? And that's when we learn that some people, like a German soldier, will end up dead. Nevertheless, right. and- yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, 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 you're right. And thrown in the river, dead yeah. and thrown in the river. Yeah, so nevertheless, within six or seven miles of the town, along the course of the river, as it flows onward to Crosset, you know, and other places, boatmen and fishermen often hauled to the surface of the water the body of a German, bloated in his uniform, killed by a blow from knife or something else. Or a club. So... Some officers are being clubbed to death and thrown in the river. So there's people who do that. And then there's people who, you know, cook them meals, have fun with them, talk, chat, laugh in private. But then in public, they have their nose up and they don't talk to German soldiers. And that's it. So the, And then Bull de Suif is starkly on the side of the one who clubs them to death. 
right? right? She sees it as this is an abomination to the French people, you know, that I have to be under German rule. She just doesn't like it. The others, you know, the wealthier class generally are only on the face of it, you know, only in public do they act that way. So, yeah, I think that's, I don't know if you have anything to say about that and the, the kind no, of I, message. I, I, I agree. I think that she is the most patriotic of, of the 10 on the stagecoach on the carriage. And, um, and for her, it's not, uh, it's certainly not a matter of, um, you know, wanting to withhold for some, a physical reason or something like that. It's just that she has absolutely no interest in pleasing, um, the Prussian soldiers at all. And, uh, and in fact, um, you know, the other character, the Democrat Corandet character wants to, uh, sleep with her in the inn <laughs> and she sleep with him yeah. only because they are so near to the, uh, Prussian, uh, soldier. Right. Um, she doesn't, she doesn't want that to be anywhere near this guy. She's that disgusted. She won't even sleep with another guy, even if they're in a different room, but next to the Prussian soldier. Right. Yeah. So for her, it really is a matter of her, yeah, I guess her moral stance against <clears throat> these invaders and these occupiers. And, um, and like you said, most of the rest of the characters for their own comfort, um, or out of their own fear are willing to compromise the values that they suggest that they hold in public, but, but that they don't really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, Oh, go ahead. Sounds like no. you saying something. Okay. Yeah. So there's this, you know, corner days, an interesting character with that, where he is, um, he loses his, uh, he, like he loses his credibility because he tries to sleep with her and you know, she punches him in the dark at one point when they're in the carriage because he tries to do something. And yeah. then, um, you know, at night they find the same thing because so he's a mixed character. I think he's a really good, he, he, I think he's a pretty good person overall. He's just not the bravest person. Right. So I think he actually likes her, um, on some level is my take. And, um, you know, he wants to sleep with her, but he's not, you know, he's, he's definitely not as patriotic as she is. Of course, no one's as safe patriotic as full to sweep. Right. But he, um, he does, he doesn't defend her when all the people are going around to persuade. He just drinks his ale off to the side, but he also doesn't attack her. Right. So he's kind of stays out of it. But he is, yeah, he, he does end up being disgusted by them, but you're right. Yes. He's not a part but of what happens point. when he's disgusted by them. What do they say? So he says that's disgusting yeah. to them. And then they have a rebuttal. Yeah. They call him out for having been, um, rejected by her. And they say that essentially his, his, he feels a certain way because of that rejection, right? Yeah. Because he was rejected. So his desire, like his, um, you know, he, he's not pure like she is, and trying to defend her, he's doing it only because he was, you know, a scorned lover, essentially. Right. That's that's kind of the impression I got. And then, of course, at the end of the story, when they're in the stagecoach or in the you know, carriage riding to Havre, he has like four eggs and they're hard boiled eggs and he eats them and doesn't give her any. He doesn't give her one. Right. Yeah. You know, he doesn't even think to offer her one. Do, do you feel and because and, I, I don't know if I'm if I interpret it the wrong way, but to me at the end, it feels like he is the most uh, brutal towards her or like maybe he takes the most pleasure in um, her pain. You know, all uh, all the other nine passion passengers, including the nuns, eat without offering her any food and they have extra food. Right. And we know the nuns pack sausage away that they didn't finish that they could have given to her. Yeah. Then he goes on when she starts crying, he goes on to start whistling and singing the Must national say. anthem. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and seems to be like almost gloating at her. To, I, 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 at least, and, and I could be taking it wrong, but I took it that he was like gloating 
And um, and yes, yeah, she rejected him. But now he's on top because look at look at the position that that she's in. It seems like he is the most and he, he's also bugging the rest of the passengers as he's doing this. But it seems like by the end of the story, he is the least sympathetic to her to her and probably because he was rejected by her. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a complicated one. I don't know. I, so I didn't take it that way. I took okay. it as part of, I mean, so I don't think he was sensitive to her at sure. all toward the end. Like he was scorned. Maybe there was a little bit of that part of it where it's like, what's the point of fighting for her at this point? I, so it's it's actually described as a practical joke. Like he's playing a practical joke when he sings the Marseille. So the, it's the national anthem. And it's un, and it's also described as undercut by her sobs. So she starts crying. And right. through, you know, so it's it's almost like punctuated by her sobbing. And I think it's a really, so, you know, it's hard to say about the motivations. This is a short story. I think Guida Mapusant is trying to draw a scene, a final closing button scene that kind of hammers something home. Because one of the things is, you know, what are the sacrifices that different classes give in a war, right? So you have the braggart who starts the war, right? Or who, who's advocating for it and doesn't fight it. You have the count who, you know, goes where the wind blows. Um, and, and, you know, but he... He also will not fight in the war. You have the rich merchants who don't fight in the war. The only fighter in the war is Bull de Sweep, really. She's the only one who fights. She and now her form of weaponry is sex. But and it's actually there's a lot of again, this is why reading the story gives it to you. There's so much description, wonderful description. I mean, the famous description passage in this sense is that as each of the nine People are trying to persuade her to give in. She is, Bull de Suif is described as a castle uh, with ramparts and, you know, it's in a very warlike and that she has to open up for the enemy, right? Um, open her walls to the enemy, which is an obvious sexual metaphor, but yeah. it's also a war metaphor. And this is, this you kind of see this throughout this, this um, descriptive language or figurative language. And again, I think it's, you know, so she, in a sense, she's the, not only the warrior, but she is, in a sense, you could think of her as France. She is France in a metaphorical or symbolic way. She's France. If you think of it like the painting, there's that famous painting of French of liberty leading the people. She's kind of liberty. She's, you know, with the breast barren, you know, you know, the image I'm talking about, the painting. I recommend if you have, if you don't know that painting, I can't, that's such a famous painter and I'm dumb but it's like maybe delacroix but don't probably not i'm sorry that i said that because <laughs> uh, i have people who are very good into painting who watch this uh i'm i'm sorry luke um so anyway it, it's that famous painting of liberty leading the people google it and i to me i take her as being liberty leading the people and they you know symbolically and all the people are convincing her why she should open up to the enemy and just kind of give in and surrender to the enemy. And so it's, you know, there, there is, they are real people. And it, so it's not overly, it's not a um, allegory, like a really broad allegory where they're just real, spe they, they do have kind of specific characteristics. And this is because of Guido Mapusant's specific writing. This is what makes his writing so powerful, um, you know, but they are kind of like archetypes. And then, uh, and then they are kind of, I think, convincing this woman to give in to the enemy, but she doesn't want to. But eventually each one of them, the nuns make the cause of tree and, you know, ends justify the means argument. They, they, the women make arguments about self-sacrifice during war, like the wives of, of the Romans, you know, and the towns during Hannibal's invasion in Rome and all these other examples of self-sacrifice of women specifically. And I think it's, you know, so that ending you're talking about, I take that to be kind of a, merging of or, or you know it's a kind of just button on the scene of that story of the whole story it's like an i it's very ironic singing sure. the the national anthem to, you know during this scene while the woman who has just been invaded for their sake for the sake of france 
and the, you know, the, the progress of France or whatever, these other classes, she's crying and no one cares about her and no one's giving her food. They don't, they don't give her food and they also snub her and, and treat her. her, you know, and at the, at the beginning of the story, there's a, there is another beautiful description and I didn't mark it down, but it's, it discusses the, the 10 passengers waiting outside of the carriage uh, early in the morning and they're all bundled up. It's freezing and they can't see each other. And the, Oh yeah, I the, got that. And the, and the coachman lines them up in there and they all get inside. And then the, the, um, the dawn starts to come and it starts to reveal to the mm. passengers who each other are. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, um, and once they realize that bull de sweep is with them, they have no interest in talking with her yeah. or consulting with her at all until they become hungry and yeah. need something from her, which of course foreshadows what's going to happen in the. Well, and if you the- think of her as symbolic too, she's mother, you know, mother France giving them food. Yeah. Right? And they, they, she happily, even though they disrespect her, they, she gives them food, but continue. Yeah. And then they convince her. And then, um, then that next morning they once again, treat her like an outcast or treat her like she's filthy and they don't want to yeah. talk to her when they get on to the, to the coach, they say something like, Oh, she's crying out of her shame. And, um, and Oh, she's crying and it's not nothing that I did. Right. And they yeah. don't really take any responsibility. And then it's punctuated with all nine other passengers eating. And she's just left there to be hungry. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it's, it's amazing how it comes full circle in that way. And, and it's very brutal. One thing that I think is interesting is what he seems to suggest about human nature mm-hmm. uh, uh, and about these people. He goes out of his way to show that the nine people other than Boule de Suif are are not nine of the same person. They're yep. very different people. They're very different. Yep. Uh, with different uh, political points of view, different levels of wealth, um, different – uh, jobs. There's men and women. There's, um, of course, the nuns who are who are religious, and the other characters perhaps are not. He shows that they make different decisions throughout the story, as you know, whether or not they take rum or whether they they want to go for a walk or sit by the fire. There's the, these nine people are all different people. So he's not saying, hey, it's this political party that no. treats people yeah. scum. This it's this socioeconomic class, or even it's atheists or religious people who treat people poorly. He shows how collectively all of these people are capable of the same evil, essentially the same very poor treatment of Boule de Suif. Yeah, no, that is a really great observation because I think it's easy to interpret this, you know, and to think that that's what I was saying about the archetypes. That it's just archetypes and you could just move on. They're just like caricatures that, you know, like, uh, uh, and that's not the case. That's what a lot of short story writers do. But what makes Guy de Maupassant such a great short story writer is that there is individuality to each of these characters. It's in the descriptions, you know, and it's in their actions too. So for instance, one of the, I think it might be the Countess, she is unable to make herself ask Boule de Suif for food. You know, eat, the way each one of them asks, you know, one corner day has no problem asking for food, right? Like, I, I'm good. Another one is, you know, there's like a little bit of problem, like, oh, fine, I'll accept it if you ask, right? But the countess is not having it, but she's starving. So she feigns, faint, you know, an illness. And she goes, oh, and they're like, you know, she faints. And then like, oh, we, we, we need this wine. And then they pour her wine and we need this. And they, so they, that's how they, she gets her food. But you know, again, so that's the kind of individuality that she's given. That's part and parcel to her being a countess, right? And in, in, in a sense, but it's also individual to her. Same thing with sure. the way they persuade. Same thing with um, just all the actions that they take. I think there's a, um, again, I think there's an individuality to them. And that's, and it's in the descriptions, the visual descriptions, you know, the way he, the way he uh, describes the beard of one of the guys, um, you know, I think it might be the German officer. So everybody, even in a very short amount of time, is given really interesting, deep characterization and totally. individual characterization. Okay, so let's go. I want to, you know, before it's too late, um, I want to make sure we talk about Stagecoach. Sure. And um, so with Stagecoach, 
We have, and the, the, the reason we're bringing Stagecoach into this, so Stagecoach is a 1939 movie made by John Ford. It's actually technically, um, I don't know if there's a light flashing in here. Um, it's actually technically based on a short story by Haycox named uh, Lord, uh, Stage to Lordsburg. Stagecoach to Lordsburg. Lordsburg. You could read this. I might put that short story on my uh, blog actually for this, but it's not very good. It's it's very bland. And the reason I brought up Bull to Sweep is John Ford, who's one of the most important cinematic directors in history, was a very literary person. And those are my favorite people, like David O. Selznick, very literary. They, John Ford um, remade, or he made, he adapted, like I think the, one of the first versions of The Grapes of Wrath, um, Aerosmith by, you know, Grapes of Wrath by Steinbeck, Aerosmith by um, um, uh, Sinclair Lewis, and a variety of literary works, he adapted them. And he said that Stagecoach was more a spirit of Bull de Suif, Guy de Montpossant's Bull de Suif, than Stagecoach to um, Lordsburg. And, and he actually, you know, there's a biography of him that actually states that. So he actually saw Guy de Maupassant as his spiritual brother in the movie Stagecoach than, um, than this movie, or than the, the Strange to Lordsburg. Now, Stage to Lordsburg does kind of set up the basic idea um, that, and there are some of the characters that are translated, but what it lacks is one, the individuality, the, the intense expression and, and passions of each of these individual people, even though they are each, um, just like in Boulder Swift, they are um, caricatures, archetypes. You have the greedy banker, the outlaw, the pr uh, prostitute with a heart of gold, the card sharp, you know, drunkard, and then you have a drunkard, uh, a drunk doctor in particular, like Doc Holliday, and then, um, or I think he's not a doctor, but, you know, and then you have the um, the wealthy Southern woman. Yeah. So you have all these archetypes, but as this the movie progresses, it's like pe like you learn a little bit about their individuality. It peels back the layers slightly, and you start to realize that these archetypes that and that, now today it's a little hard. This is nineteen thirty nine. The Western short, the dime novels, the the the. There have been hundreds of B-level um, movie westerns for the last 20 years in America. They've established a kind of, you know, and in the newspapers, established a kind of archetype for these people in the minds of Americans. And John Ford is kind of questioning all of those stereotypes. Like, do we really know the, the Ringo kid, you know, the, the outlaw? Do we really understand the sheriff in his motives? Do we really understand the prostitute? Do, you know, and, and it's a really great story. And it's informed by the kind of social criticism and the way that the, um, we can almost call it a, a play or a story of manners, how each of the characters relate to one another. So that's why we chose Stagecoach um, for, to talk about as well for the last, the second half of our conversation here. So Stagecoach. So I kind yeah, of, I'll, go ahead, please. I'll tell you this, I, you know, I saw Stagecoach the first time a couple of years ago and um, and had not read Bull to Sweep. And it was interesting watching it this time with Bull to Sweep fresh in my mind and yeah. uh, and and comparing it. Um, it's it's obviously not a direct adaptation, um, yeah. but you can certainly see the influence, I think. And um, and I, I do think that um you know in in stagecoach we're sympathetic to a lot more i i felt sympathetic to more characters than i did in bull to sweep where it feels like she is the character that you feel mm. good or bad about good or bad for yeah. um uh in in stagecoach um you know there's multiple you know while there is a prostitute she doesn't she's not picked on by everybody in the exact same way, although, of course, she is. I mean, I, I she's I, treated I ba pretty badly. I mean, she's kicked out of town at the beginning for one. She is by, by the ladies of the, the petticoat of, brigade. As well yeah, I'm that's called. right. And and um, and they're great, by the way, the casting yeah. of those ladies and, yeah, and the, 
the, the, yeah, the, the nose up turn and the, the uh, woman's long horse face. The casting yes. in this movie is amazing. It is. But Doc Boone is he's OK with her because he's also being kicked out of he's town. He's being kicked out as well. Being, yeah. being a drunk. Um, and then, of course, the Ringo kid um, is you know, he has a crush on her the whole time. And, and he's very defensive of her as a woman where the other woman um, whose name escapes me, I have I have. IMDb. She's the southern woman. Miss Mallory. Mallory, yeah. She's um, she's like the Scarlet O'Hara. Or not she's like the the not Scarlet O'Hara. She's like the well, just rich Southern lady, like a, a real lady. Like, yeah. Like coming she, from this pre Civil War era type thing. So it's, it takes place in eighteen eighty, by the way. In the West. Eighteen eighty is when this takes place. In okay. the West, in a territory, so not a state. This is important for the Western. Um, in terms of it's not an official state, so it's there's not actual there's not a constitution. There's not a bill of rights. It's just a loose kind of, if you meet certain requirements, we'll make you a state eventually. Um, and I don't remember, exa- I think it might be New Mexico where it takes place. like, Or that's where it becomes New Mexico or something. Sure. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. And so I, th- but these, so these places, they, it starts off in Tonto and they go to Lordsburg. And now it's important that they talk about territory I think it's important to the artistry of John Ford that he doesn't give it specific historical names. They're, they, I think there are those locations historically, but he doesn't say it's like Lordsburg, New Mexico territory. Like nobody makes those. It's just Lordsburg, it's Tonto. And I think what he's doing is he's just trying to make them, you know, not just historical places. He wants to make them these imaginative places that these are going. So the, it's a kind of, you know, he's hobbling together the geography for his own purposes and is what I mean. Okay, interesting. And he's going, so it it starts off in Tonto. It's a stagecoach of these characters that are all leaving Tonto, um, including, you know, so the greedy banker and so on, and they're going to Lordsburg. And the problem is that um, Geronimo, the Apache, has escaped or has left his, um, um, what's it called? Reservation. Reservation and he's on, on the, the war path. And so it is dangerous now living in a city is fine and tonto or lordsburg but on the way is dangerous because especially without an escort from the u.s calvary um which they only get half of the way through they don't get a you know a, the whole time they don't get a an escort because the the guys have to go and do something they have orders to go somewhere else so anyway that's the basic story is just getting there and then you know the the whole um, situations that occur along the way that we could talk about, but go ahead. Sure. Well, yeah, I think, um, that's a, that's definitely a good summary of, of the story. And, and, you know, I'm curious where you see the, the primary connections are maybe primary inspirations are taken from bull to sweep. Well, um, I think uh, of some, you know, obviously the prostitute, yeah. um, character. So, oh, are you gonna say another one? Go ahead. No, go ahead. So I, uh, I take it more as so yeah there's the prostitute but it's more about the social criticism part and now the questions are different thematically in each of these pieces so in Bold to Sweep one of the questions is about this ancient tribal um land France and how people in the varying factions react to being conquered right and and so the question is, how do they treat each other, um, you know, and, and what what class, you know, so there, there's a certain, for instance, it's not all about Bull de Suif, even though it's heavily about her. There's also a reluctance to talk to the Democrat, Cornudet. There's a reluctance. Yeah. There's even a slight reluctance between the count and the wealthy um, merchant. And then, of course, the, you know, the sly wine, the shrewd wine person. He's kind of an outcast in a sense to the count. That's not heavily there, but it's there a little bit. Sure. For example, um, and something I really enjoy about Stagecoach is that not only is Doc Boone a doctor and a drunk, but he is also a union veteran. Yes. And um, and uh, and Hatfield is the card a, sharp. Um, say again. The card sharp Hatfield. Yes, the card sharp character. Yeah, the gambler. He is a gambler, a Confederate uh, veteran. 
And, um, and you know, of course, initially those two characters uh, don't get along. Um, yeah. They're, they, they don't like each other at all based on where they were at during the war. Um, uh, although later on in the film, there is a, there is a scene that I enjoy where um, once Hatfield does agree with Doc Boone, it seems that his, um, you know, his willingness to agree with Doc Boone holds more holds more weight than anybody else's vote because it's like, hey, if Hatfield Hatfield agrees with this guy, then it must be then Doc Boone must be in the right, right? Because they don't agree on anything. And that reminded me of Corin Day and and um, and then the more uh, I think that they re- they referred to the other characters as being of the party Mm -hmm. right and um and so you kind of get a little bit of that um and then you certainly you get the sense with with the maybe it's with the count or the factory owner in bull de suif who want to leave um who want to leave rune for the sake of their money you kind of get the the sense that that the banker is sort of doing something like that although the banker in in stagecoach it seems like is just stealing well he's just stealing yeah yeah, he, he's selling he's fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, and, and and he's um, leaving his wife. I think that's part of it. Is she's like, I need five dollars to do this and this and this, and and it's like she's the leader of the petticoat brigade, petticoat yeah. brigade that's kicking out the prostitute. Um, and and um, Doc Doc, um, what's his Doc, name? Doc, Doc Boone. Boone. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 there's the great scene at the beginning where she says like, Hey, we're having a dinner tonight, and we're hosting the petty the petticoat brigade yeah. again. And, and it's like it almost seems it, he was planning his his leave before that. But it almost seems like that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. Like he's like, I'm not staying for one more of these dinners. I'm getting this money and getting out of here. Of course, the, the banker in this in this movie is is, um, you know, is quite a scumbag and everything. I, I don't think that the Ringo kid character, I think that that character, John Wayne's character is unique to stagecoach. I don't think we get that hero in um sorry keep going that's all right i, I don't think we get that hero in um bull to sweep unless it were bull to sweep herself but but i don't think that he's meant to represent her however there is a theme there's another theme um that is present in bull to sweep that is also present in sage coats it's, it's this idea that um you don't care about somebody until they can do something for you mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden um, your mind changes real quick. And then I suppose um, the real judgment of, of your character is whether or not your mind changes back again after that. And so in the case of Bull to Sweep, none of them care about her because she's a prostitute until they're hungry or until they need her to sleep with a German officer in order to get out of that hotel, mm-hmm. right? And in Stagecoach, um, there's this repeated idea with the Ringo kid where he's a jailbird and this guy's got to be locked up again because he's just going to kill, but, Oh, he is good with a gun. So when we, when we need him, mm. um, you know, to fight the Apaches or whomever, uh, you know, he might now. Well, but is why also, is the sheriff actually taking charge of him? Do you remember? The sheriff knows him from, from their, he's um, saving his life. He's trying to save his life. Yeah, and and they like branded cattle together or something with like that. With his father, he they, he was a cow puncher with the kid's father. Yeah, and and I don't think the sheriff is comparable to to the characters in Bull to Sweep because I don't think the sheriff uses John Wayne and his gun just so, for the sake. Of, yeah, because he and in the end he ends up letting him go, and and that would not be how it happens in Bull to Sweep. If it were if it were to be directly like Bull to Sweep in the case of the sheriff, he would have let John Wayne risk his life to, to fight for the stagecoach. And then he would have, you know, hated him again. And, and it's, you know, it's a little more complicated because he's, a, because the sheriff's a man of the law. And, um, well, so there's, but I, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, but what? I, I do think that some of the other characters, um, one of them says something like, Oh, don't, don't talk to him. He's in, it's, it's when he's in handcuffs and somebody's, it might be the banker, but somebody discounts the Ringo kid just because yeah. he's a jailbird. Don't talk to him. He's useless until he needs him. Uh, and I think it's the banker who has that, who has that feeling. 
Um, but yeah, then I think by that's the, end, the banker. He, he, he again doesn't seem to to care. So it you know it's not a direct um, you know it's not a direct take, but that theme I felt was there, and and you somewhat see it also where Mrs. Mallory does not care for uh, for Dallas, the prostitute. Um, and then turns around once Dallas is able to help her out with, you know, her pregnancy and everything. Seems though that the characters in Stagecoach experience more of an arc where maybe a lot of them yes. learn something on their journey. More than Boulder Sweep, yeah, for sure. We have Boulder Sweep. There's zero arc, and that's well, it's more that- negative. It's more cynical, I think. Yeah, right. Exactly. It, it all. It's like she loses. She yeah. her, her walls come down. She surrenders. She has sex with the enemy, and the other characters um, are okay with it, and they yeah. they persuaded her. That's so, the sting of that story. Is yeah, that they, they don't change. Yeah, I mean, this is an, a typical American, at least at this time, of the very positive, you know, ideas of what things. So I don't think there's a one to one relation between the characters. That's not how I look at the. There, there's obviously the prostitute, the prostitute. Yeah. And there are some, you know, ways in how they treat each other that's similar at, at certain points. But I, I think of it as, again, um, abstractly in Bold Sweep, you have, you know, a group of people representing different elements of society or different sides of society in a conquered land or in a very challenging situation trying to move from one point to another. And it's about how they treat each other. And in that story, it's, you know, about their, it's more about their relationship to patriotism and the love of country. What John Ford does with that same thing, though, is he transforms it in a very uniquely American way. So one thing to understand, I think that might be helpful with Stagecoach, is that it's done in 1939, along with two movies, um, se- separate movies that are completely, totally different, but uh, Dodge City and Jesse James. And, uh, and this is basically the beginning of the Renaissance of the Western. These are a level movies, uh, especially Dodge City and Jesse James. And it is, um, they are, um, what was I going to say? There is a sense where the moguls of the film industry, these um, people who love America are trying to understand and define America as, as a country. Like what is the roots of America? And the question and Ford, and we can talk about how he's different than these other guys because he's very different. I mean, he he's he's been called the Shakespeare of the Western genre, and in and, and the way that he develops a visual language and a very expression, you know, very purposeful and artistic. Um, but he his question is what you know what binds a community together, because so just as a background, to, he was born of. Um, Irish American Im- or Irish immigrants into American into America. And one of the very deep American questions is which side do you land on as you become more successful in America? Right? So as you know, he's very successful at this point as a person. So does he just shuck off his Irish roots and become mm-hmm. Amer- you know, American? These are the kinds of things, you know, for him that he was thinking about. And I think it's very relevant to a lot of, a lot of immigrants and people is, you know, you respect your your um, hard your parents who came here, and you know, you know, swam the channel or whatever they did to get you know to get to America. Um, all these hardships, and then you're now getting the byproduct of that. So do you just like become American and forget everything? Um, and so what he does is is he takes this story of these people going to you know these different again their archetypes, right? So you like you pointed out. This is in 1880. So you have a northerner and a southerner. And you have two southerners, right? You have a wealthy banker who represents banking. You have the law sheriff. You have an outlaw who is wrongly accused, by the way. So he's wrongly accused. But he's 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 a gunslinger, essentially, and an outlaw. And then you have the prostitute. You have the wine merchant, or he in this case, he's a, a whiskey drummer. Um, and then you have the doctor drunkard, the town drunk guy. And you have all these characters. And... Because what's really important is the, the elements of when they're in the carriage and how they operate with each other. So, for instance, the southern gentleman or the, the um, gambler mm-hmm. um, gives a silver flask to the lady 
right? When she's going to drink, because she's going to drink out of this canteen like one of the men. But he's like, oh, no, 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 she's a lady. And he gets out this silver flask. He pours her a little bit of it and gives it to her and she drinks it daintily. And then she notices that it's not, you know, she's like, who is this? Somebody he killed, by the way. So this guy's a murderer because he right. kills people during, you know, if they disputes in gambling. But he's like, I don't know who that building eh, Put that away. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and then the other, uh, and then the Ringo kid, who's played by John Wayne, by the way, I don't think we mentioned that. He gives the canteen to Dallas, the prostitute. And he said, sorry, no silver for you. And it's like, it's, he says it very well, but uh, sorry, he says, sorry, I ain't got no silver for you or something like that. And she said, yeah, oh, this will do fine. Yeah. And he tries, he tries to get the cup from Hatfield. Yeah, he thinks he's going to, but Hatfield won't do it. So he's like, well, here's a canteen. He gives water. Um, and then there's the, the really important scene when they're sitting at, when they go to that first stop, uh, Dallas, you know, uh, the, the Southern woman, Mallory, is that her name? Is that? Uh -huh. So yep. when Mallory sits at the head of the table and then um, uh, Ringo kid brings over Dallas. He says, Oh, have a seat here right next to her. And the Southern gentleman, the um, gambler says to Mallory, because she's next to a prostitute, which is not acceptable for her to sit in the presence of prostitutes. She's too much of a lady to be by a prostitute. So he says yeah. he gives her an out. Cause she won't eat. She's like, Oh, I don't know. What to, you know, she, she's, she's stuck because she can't be impolite. She's not allowed to, cause she's a lady, but she can't be around this person. So the, the gambler from the South says, you know, here there's, there's a, a it's a little cooler by the window and he brings right. her over there and she leaves. And then Ringo kid thinks that it's about him. It's not about him that they're leaving. He's like, man, you know, I guess I, I assume that they would, um, you know, take, that, that I could just kind of go back into society, but I guess not. Right. And it's actually about the prostitute. It's actually about um, Dallas. Right. So, but my point is that as you watch the movie, it's all about how can they come together? How can, what can bind a community that is all these disparate manners and feelings and ways of going about it. Like for instance, even doubt, you know, so the, the sheriff wants to take the kid home, but he's also, you know, uh, was a, he's, he's, he, he's not just an abstraction for law. He also is the, the friend of the, the father to the Ringo kid. And he doesn't want Ringo kid to go into Lordsburg and fight somebody and die. Cause there's three brothers. They're all going to kill him if he goes after him. So right. there's all these confusions about like, how do they treat each other along the way? You know, like the, the, it's even wonderful when the, um, the banker comes to sit down when he first gets, they, they, he hails him, he goes and sits down. Do you remember how much room he takes up? He like, you know, he man spreads yeah. big time. Like he just spreads out and, and the two little ladies are like this in the corner. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, it's just like, he treats, you know, he's like, good, you know, and he starts smoking. And so again, there's this question of what brings them together. And there is a moment before the battle scene at the end. That bring and we haven't even talked about the Meek guy, the the guy whose real name is something Meek, the the oil drummer or the uh, whiskey yeah, drummer. Yeah, Samuel Peacock, and then they keep calling him Haycock or Haycock. Something. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. Do, do you know the or go ahead? Well, I think that you're right. I think it 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 definitely starts the the group starts out as a bunch of individuals, each with um, very specific trajectories that are unique to them. Well, and, I, so I would call them archetypes at the beginning and they become individuals, just like with Bull to Sweep. Not, do you disagree with that? No, no, I, I, I think that you're right. But what I mean to say is that they, um, they, they, what I mean to say when they're with, that they're individual is that each character has their own thing that they want that is separate from everybody else. Mm, yeah. Although yeah. they're, um, once they're, um, I guess once their desires or their needs start to align, they Sorry, begin to come together. And... Say again. Keep going. I can, I just... um, so, uh, you know, for example, um, Doc Boone uh, lives to drink, and um, and it seems that um, Hatfield lives to gamble, and um, John Wayne's character, the Ringo Kid, is there for revenge, and the banker is trying to. You know, get out, Go, and get, get away with the fifty thousand. Yeah. yeah, they exactly in eighteen eighty. By the way, yeah. They, so they, it's they a lot of money. 
tons of money and they, they each have their little thing that they want and and it doesn't involve the other people and the other people in many ways are just in their in their in each other's way um but they largely seem to come together uh once they realize that um not even so much when they're in in danger as when mrs mallory it's found that she's pregnant yes and um and she goes to give birth and then suddenly there's this team effort to sober up doc <clears throat> doc boone with black coffee and suddenly uh dallas goes from being a, a the prostitute to the um uh what do you call the ladies I, i'm trying to think of it too and the something mom or something or the um sp- i'm an idiot bunch no, I, of guys I, trying to figure this out <laughs> two dudes like wait we know what this is um yeah. but yeah it's the, the woman who helps with um you know giving birth with helping yeah. the the i feel it's like an idiot gonna, it's gonna come to us it'll come yeah. to us eventually yeah uh, so she is that she does become that person right but remember she was also nice earlier midwife like, midwife thank you so she was very nice to um to mallory earlier and like she's, she offers her shoulder to she says off. no thank you yeah. and she also says i'm sorry for your you know i'm sorry that your husband was hurt because her uh mallory's trying to find her her husband's who's in the army and he right. was hurt and they don't know where he is um so so yeah i mean she's always been good she has she's the prostitute with the heart of gold oh, but yes, she, yes, she yes, realizes yes. that you know they don't like her because she's a prostitute yeah and and, and but they be they begin to see her like, differently yeah. specifically mrs mallory seems to begin to see her differently uh and and you know then at that point once they have the child there's more of a collective there's something that's bonded them although maybe less so with the banker um yeah uh, he he is just kind of always uh selfish and 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 i think that that's important too i think that that keeps the movie kind of grounded that it's not too yeah, he's much the only a, one who has no arc he's yeah. a jerk throughout and i think that's very telling and unfortunate personally i think that's a mistake but um a, a mistake of the of the this is a whole nother oh. story but i think I, i'm very pro finance and capitalism but i think john ford is doing this the normal hollywood leftist thing of hating on financiers as the most evil money grabbers and yada, yada, yada. But that's another, and I think this is like a clear example of how the, you know, this, that theme goes back thousands of years, right? Like sure. Jesus threw the money lenders out of uh, the church, the, the yeah. Shylock and Shakespeare and so on and so forth. The Jewish. Yeah. So, so it, it, it is it, an unfortunate thing. I just uh, yeah. take of, of that character. I, I agree. And, and yeah, the banker actually has a line that I didn't disagree with, even though I felt that the movie was saying it, I, you know, had him saying it ironically that the banker says something like what's good for the banks is good for the country. And I don't think that that's always true, but in general, I I also feel that, um, that, uh, well, but the problem is that he freaking stole $50,000. So he's saying that while he's taking money from his people. So there's a kind of irony in him. What's that? Yeah, that's the payroll money. You're exactly right. He's taking it so, right out of his own employees. Yeah, payment. that's the irony of that whole statement is that um, he is robbing the, not just his own people, but all the people in that town. Like that whole town, they're not going to get paid. Right. Um, well, they will because he gets caught at the end. But the point is that he says that line and it's completely taken as ironic because he is a thief. And so it's, you know, what's good for the banks is good for the country, <laughs> you know, yeah. as, as he takes all the money. And so it's, you know, I, I understand what you're saying and I agree with you. I'm just saying like, ugh, that's my pet peeve. It's, it's, it's the way his character is written, yeah. right? It's, well, yeah, I mean, as, he's just, a, he is the only one who doesn't have any individuality. Yeah. He becomes, and, and I agree. Now, 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 let me ask you this, um, cause around that same, you know, the, around the birthing scene, um, yeah. We have, you know, that that birth takes place at the home of um, this Mexican guy who's married to an Apache woman. Mm -hmm. Right. And he 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 thinks it's probably good for him that he's married to her because Geronimo won't mess with him. Yeah. Um, What do you what do you take of that sequence? Like, I, what do you think is the is the is the point of 
her and her sending those guys off. Is that to of the the Apache woman, the uh-huh. the squall as she's called? Yeah, yeah. Um. Well, I mean, plot wise, it gets them to leave because they wouldn't leave otherwise. So I don't know. Ex- that's a good question. I, I think that's a really good question to ask, like what her motivation is. Um, sure. You know, you could ask whether she was ever truly loyal to him. There is something interesting to think about with, again, because if we think about this as like, you remember I was talking about manners and how everyone treats each other and the question of, you know, they're in this wild place. And I'd love to show some images in a few minutes, but uh, from the movie itself, but they're in this wild place. Like they're in a territory. It's not civilized. Right. It's not. And by the way, I'm not going to be PC about this. The, the, so if you guys disagree with this, it's too bad. You're wrong. The West was wild. It was undeveloped. Yes, there were aboriginals there, but they were wild and savage and uh, they didn't have things like the wheel and they didn't know how to farm. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that we could, you know, it's a whole nother discussion. But I, I'm, I'm going to get crap for the PC stuff or non PC stuff. But anyway, that's that. I mean, this wasn't even a question in 1939. Like everyone knew the Indians were the savage. They represented the savage West um, and the brutality of it because, you know, they would kill you, which is true. They would skin you. This is true. They would rape the women. This is true. So there is a lot of, you know, stuff like that going on that we see in the movie. So the one that I think there's a question, you know, so we have these, there's a question of, you know, whether that squall was ever really, you know, um, loyal to them, uh, to, to him. I don't know. Um, you know, she might have thought it would be beneficial because the stagecoach is going to go off. So she's going to go tell. Maybe she's the one who told Geronimo that, hey, this the stagecoach is coming. Be prepared because he's going to make an appearance at the end. I don't right. know. Um, she sings a song that I don't know the words to it. It's in some other language. I don't know. So I don't know what she's actually saying. Right. Um, so that song, I assume, is part of it. You know, maybe she's just not happy there. I mean, she didn't seem like a happy song. So and I'm not 100% sure about that character and what her motivation is. I do think that that moment you're talking about, though, with them, them all in that place, and there's the birth, is really critical because that is where they kind of become a community, right? That's yeah. they so, Like you said, they – what was that? Let, let, let me just ask you this, though, before we leave okay, sure, uh, sure. The, the, the Apache lady, um, and, and not to – return back to bull to sweep too much, but one no, let's do bull to sweep for sure. Yeah. Well, one point of view, I guess the, the primary point of view then of, of bull to sweep is that they are the French under Prussian occupation. Yeah. I also don't think that this is a, uh, even though this would be the opposite situation, I also don't think it's, it's equal, but just from the Apache ladies point of view, if this was the Apache land, and it hadn't been, as you pointed out, th- these weren't states yet. They hadn't been, there was no constitution. It hadn't been fully conquered yet. So mm-hmm. in a way, um, the stagecoach and all of the people on it are, they almost represent the Prussian side. They are almost the occupiers mm-hmm. now, whereas the Apaches are the French being occupied. And and I don't, I don't, I, I that's possible. I yeah. I couldn't help but watch it and wonder mm. a, a, about that because, because, you know, they were the, you know, but I, I, I don't know that might not have at all been John Ford's. And, and of course the, the fact is, is the West, um, you know, the United States has not, you know, Americans haven't been occupied in the, in the way that the French were occupied, right? The, the, the native Americans yeah. were, but but we we don't have that same story that the French had in 1870 and 1871. Well, um, I'll say that I'm not going to 100% agree that the Native Americans were occupied. I wouldn't call it that personally. But that that's a debate we could have at some other point about you know Native Americans and and how um, that whole story behind them and and our relationship to you know, to them. And there is a lot to know about and to learn about. It's a very interesting story. Um, The question in this movie though, is that they are. So, so if you're going to argue in this particular movie, is it possible that Geronimo and the Apaches see them as the threat? 
Yes. I mean, I think that that they, well, at least they see them as the enemy, right? Sure. And so, so they see the cavalry as the enemy. They see these people, you know, these white people as the enemy, although the Mexican isn't white, he's, you know, Mexican, but it's, it's, right. so it's not really even about race. It's just about these people that are there. I don't know that they're, you know, like, for instance, it's a Cherokee that tells them about Geronimo, right? At the beginning of the movie, a Cherokee is the one who tells them Geronimo's on the warpath. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 I think John Ford is clever in not making it about white versus Indian or these types of things. It's, it's that this Geronimo who is famous and in the thirties, people would still probably know that name through popular culture. It's a famously brutal Apache in history. So the name Geronimo is very famous and you might even, I mean, you might hear like Geronimo, you might've heard that type of thing from pop, pop culture. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. 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 The, from, from paratroopers and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Like, and I don't know the etymology to it. I don't know if it's from him, but I think there, but there's definitely a pop, like he's known specifically for brutally raping, killing, scalping settlers, people who are. Um, and this happened all the time. You see this in other movies, but it's a historical fact about, you know, if you were on the prairie or if you're on the West and, um, you know, a band of Indians came by, they might just kill you and, you know, take all your stuff. Right. And, Even and, if you already had an agreement with them, but that, that's another story. Sure. And, and did Geronimo actually live in 1880 when the movie know. takes place? Uh, I mean, one, one thing that I do think is interesting about this film and, and that makes it I just think it has to be considered when I watch it today is we are, I guess by now we're 60, 70, 80. We're, we're more removed from stagecoach than stagecoach. Oh is yeah. Good point. It takes place. Right. Yeah. And, and they're, they're some of the audience members in stagecoach could have been kids during the civil war and, and the years immediately, I mean, or at least the byproduct. Well, this is, yeah, that is a really good point. Gone with the wind, which I think is a, a kind of establishing narrative that happens in 1937 when it's written. And then the movie is done in 1939 by David O. Selznick. And right. it's a hugely popular uh, book, but uh, Margaret Mitchell learned of the stories of the South on her father's and grandfather's knee when she was right. a little girl in the right. South. So she wrote in 1937, um, her, you know, but her parents were in that war, right? So there is a kind of much more direct connection. And a lot of people are in that position where it's like, you know, people in 1939, most of them, you know, most of the people from the Civil War are probably dead, most of them, you know, maybe like World War II at this point. I don't know the exact, you know, well, for us today in World War II, uh, where it's like they're all getting older and dying and yeah, and and th I guess think of it this way too, because if if this movie takes place in 1880, uh, which makes sense because Doc Boone easily could have been like 15 years out of the Civil War, right? He's not like a fresh Civil War veteran, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and same thing with Hatfield for that matter. If this movie takes place in 1880, that means um, that it is made, and if if it's made in 1939, that gives it 60 years. Um, yeah. I was told there'd be no math, but, um, <laughs> no, uh, 40 plus 20 is 60, so yeah, 59 but the, years, but the baby that's born in this movie, um, it let's, if that baby were born in that real time would be only 60 years old watching the film. So, so you're not even, mm. you're not even that old of a person. Um, if you're going into the theater and you could be like, Oh, this is a movie about my childhood. And if you are, like you were pointing out, of the of what is the World War II generation to us, if you're in your um, late 60s or if you're in your 70s going into the movie theater to watch Stagecoach, this movie is about like your teenage years. Like what what a what a early 2000s tale would be to me or something like that, which is which I think, you know, the, the whole reason to bring it up, I guess, is is that I, I have to believe that to some extent some of the things that are portrayed in the movie and the some of the attitudes of the movie are there because because they were influenced by the actual people who who lived them 
right? So I so yes, and that that's like a broader point that's interesting about the history of this. And what I was talking about with the Renaissance of the Western is because this was a conscious effort by the because Westerns before 1939 were all B movie Westerns. They're B movies. And so they were very cheap, quick little fun vignettes of the guy chasing some Indian or a guy chasing an outlaw or an outlaw chasing this person or train robbery. There's a whole bunch of stuff like that. And that, you know, it was, it was on a cycle. They pumped them out a couple times, you know, a couple movies a week type thing. I mean, they were yeah. just pumping these movies out, and but they're all cheaply done. But then in 1939, you get Gone with the Wind. It's a huge budget film. You get Dodge City, which is which is with an A-list actor, Errol Flynn. You get um, another, uh, I don't remember who the, it might be a Fonda. I think one of the Fondas is in uh, Jesse James in 1939. And then, um, and then you get John Wayne, who interestingly was chosen by John Ford because he's the anti-A-list person at this point. He is the stereotypical B-level person. So Stagecoach is different from these other movies I've talked about. Because if you watch Dodge City or Jesse James, you'll see at the beginning a long block of text where it says, you know, um, Dodge City, X, Y, Z. It's, you know, in 1864, this happened. And it's giving you all this historical context. And mm -hmm. uh, same thing with Jesse James. And basically this, the narrative is, you know, um, the, the, we've, we've, we've won the war, the, the community settled and everything's good except this happens. Or we won the war, everything's settled and everything's good except or everything's not well. You know, um, Civil War is over and we are building the Transcontinental Continental Railroad and all is well or not well. That, those are the two basic narratives in the early Renaissance of Westerns, especially okay. um, with the outlaw, like, you know, causing the outlaws because, you know, uh, of the railroad or, you know, it's causing more growth. But then there's a problem. OK, Stagecoach is the anti that it's, it's a lot of it's done on John Ford's dime. And he doesn't use that text at the beginning. He situates it almost in a fable-like way where it's, it's just, and, and again, this is what I was talking about with there's not, um, you know, there's not the, uh, 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 he doesn't say like it's Lordsburg, New Mexico. He doesn't say it's, you know, Tonto this. It's like just Tonto and Lordsburg. It's just this gen, generic abstract cities in a sense. Uh, even though I think there were actual places like that at some point. So, the point is that I think he, um, at this time, all these directors, and John Ford might be the best of them overall, overall, or he is the best of them, I think, are trying to figure out what is America all about. And I think Stagecoach, they all do the very interesting things. We could talk about those other movies some other time. Um, but what Stagecoach does is, like John Ford does in a lot of his movies, is he asked the question of, you know, again, how do we form or what binds a community together? And how does that come together? And in that moment where they're all in the house with the baby, it's the baby comes together, but there's an interesting thing that is in Westerns about the studly man. Um, and you see this a lot where it's like these big, strong men who are the the you know, the 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 creators of of civilization they bring civilization but who are the only two characters in stagecoach who have actually gotten a woman pregnant besides mallory's husband of course but, okay that's, that's gonna be my but there's two thing. guys and it's mentioned many times okay so peacock has had, has a bunch of kids. five kids yeah and curly the driver and they, and, and, and most used to again Sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. And Curly, peacock, the, peacock has five kids, and right, right, right. Curly has um, kids as well with his wife, the driver. Oh, okay, Curly does. And and it's really, <laughs> and he also is portrayed in this very effeminate way. He talks all the time, right? This is very different than John Way, who you talk slow, talk low, and don't say too much. Curly is like really out, like very high pitched voice. I went to it and we went over here and, and my wife, I'm feeding all of Mexico, right? He has this very high yeah, pitched yeah, yeah. voice. Uh, it's very, you know, and, but he has kids and um, Meek or the actor's name is Meek, but Peacock, the, the whiskey dr drummer or the, the rum drummer or whatever, he is being pushed over by Bo Doc Boone this whole time, 
right? Like at some point, Doc Boone is like wiping his face with his scarf when he's sweating. He's like, I'll take care of you. And, and you know, uh, Peacock is just sitting there. And, um, you know, he keeps drinking. Doc Boone keeps drinking. He loves him because he's drinking all of his stuff. Yeah. But when does Peacock grow a pair and tell the other big boys what to do? Do you remember? It's a very important moment. I don't. Not off the top of my head. So um, first, the sheriff, after the baby's born, the sheriff's about to go, yippee. And, and uh, Peacock says, Shh, no. And then another one says something. He's like, Shh, no, the woman. So he gets a moral authority as a father because he has that thing. Like he, he knows that and they don't. Right. Yeah. Ringo, you're right. He does say something to the, to the uh, effect he, of, you know, having, having had a, you know, having had a bunch of kids. Yeah. He um, knows what he's talking about. Yeah. And, and we can't travel. We can't travel yeah. tomorrow because he understands that that's so, how the world. So what's starting to bind them is a kind of authority based on what they've done in their past, right? Ringo Kid is a virgin, by the way. This is very important. He's very naive. Now, this is subtle to us today. You have to watch okay. it again and think about it uh, carefully. But why doesn't he understand what's going on with Dallas? Because he, So he asked him, how long, how long was he in jail? And he was in jail from the time he was 17. 16, actually. So I, He's, he was going on 17. Okay, going on. So yeah, I guess the the implication is that um, he was so young when he went into jail, he would have been, I guess, too young to know about. Well, yeah, and this is not, this is eighteen eighty, you know. So even in nineteen thirty nine, that might be a little hard, but to believe, and in twenty twenty, like a sixteen year old, not you know, a lot of sixteen year olds have sex. A lot right. of them see porn today. Eighteen eighty, right. no, very unlikely. So you know, the the idea that. You know, he hasn't seen a prostitute or had sex with a woman is is very likely. So he's no. very sexually un yeah, very sexually naive. There's other signs. Like he doesn't understand why what's going on with Dallas until the very, very end. He has no idea that she's a prostitute. Right. He doesn't get it. Like he thinks that everyone's acting weird because he is an outlaw. They don't care that he's an outlaw. They don't. Not, not really. The very, very minor uh, annoyances. It's mostly Dallas that they're all attracted to. And she knows this about him. She knows that he's a virgin. She knows that he's naive to ask her this question, uh, to marry her, She, you know, which he does. He knows, she knows all this because she knows men. She understands men. And, um, you know, so that that's a, a big part of the dilemma at the heart of the story. That right. she's sure that as soon as he finds out, he's going to be out of there. So she doesn't want to. She wants him herself, to escape now. Right, and, and and she doesn't want to let herself believe because she, she says she has a line where she says, like, I was trying not to hope or I was hoping, but it was hurting or something like that. And yeah. some line there towards the end where she, she, of course, she liked the idea of settling down with him on his big ranch and giving up her um, her work. But she was sure as soon as he figured it out, I, I did get that he I, I, I actually I wasn't sure I did not get that he was a virgin. I, I just didn't even think about it um, a, a, about like that just in, in any way, although it totally makes sense. I, I did think, OK, it seems that they're playing it that he. Well, so um, just before you go on, just one other like when he when the guy asks him Ringo Kid. Yeah. How when he went to jail, do you remember what Ringo Kid was about to go do and what he was asking Doc about? He was a, he was asking Ringo Kid was asking Doc about should I marry this girl? I'm going to ask her this. And then Doc, who's very experienced, he's given, you know, he's been the doctor for hundreds of babies. He says, "When did you go to jail again?" Right? And and he's like, "I was almost I was 16." And he's um, like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, it's like, that's why. So, so there are little subtle hints like that about his, okay, but sorry, go ahead. Keep, well, keep going. I, I did. Yeah. I did take that. Maybe he didn't know that she was a prostitute and that that could be a, a twist for him at the end where he suddenly finds it out. But I also thought that they, and even though I'd seen the film before, I didn't remember. I also thought they might be setting up a twist for us where she finally reveals that she's a prostitute. And then he says something like, yeah, oh yeah, I, I know. And then, and then he's just so virtuous because he knew, but he didn't care. But, mm. uh, but you're right. He, he didn't know. Um, he definitely didn't know. 
but of course, when he does find out, he still doesn't seem to care that much, right? I mean, he still doesn't seem to care at all, actually. Yeah. Um, why don't I think he cares? And and it, he doesn't. He like or it's not caring. It's not that he it, he. It's a very interesting moment in this in the movie. And maybe we should actually watch this. We can, if yeah, we can, maybe it'd be fine. cool. We could watch a couple minutes of it um, for those who stuck around this long, <laughs> but it's, this is your prize. Yeah. This is your prize because he, so first off, this happens at the very end of the movie. They've, they've, you know, fought off the Indians. They've survived uh, the stagecoach, and they're in Lordsburg and they are now he still doesn't know she's a prostitute, but he, um, Ringo Kid is going to walk her home. Now, um, you know, you asked, you said he he doesn't care. I I think what the movie does beautifully, and why John Ford is so amazing, is are you able to see it now? Not yet. It's still just the Skype um, oh. symbol. <clears throat> so maybe maybe try sharing from Skype. Is that what you did uh, last time? Oh, there we go. Ah, oh, there it is. Yeah, so I think it was. Do you remember the timestamp that we had? Uh, yeah, we yeah, totally. This is this should be right. This is going to be the two of them walking. Um, okay, it's going to start well, in about twenty seconds. Can you fast forward it to that point? Because I don't want to. Because of YouTube, I don't want to have too much um, time taken up. Here it so, goes. Okay, and then do we have uh, sound? Oh, yep. Hold on just a sec. Audio's back, and uh, do you want me to take the video back too? Um, wait. So pause it. So that wasn't the walk, by the way. Oh, are you trying to get to where she get where they actually end up, or? Yeah. So um, that's why I wanted you to fast forward because that was not the walk. He doesn't understand it yet. I see. Yeah, so it's not there yet. So, I mean, look at even the way he's looking at her. So go back more. So that look right there, he almost, he understands her a little bit more. It's, he's starting to, so go back. You gotta go. There's a, and there's a particular, go back again. Another 10 seconds. So I think you need to go back just to where we were, like right here, and just kind of play it forward. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'll, and if we can have, I don't have sound anymore, by the way. Yep, I'll give you sound. She doesn't want him to see, right? And he says, we ain't saying goodbye. It's intercut with this scene where we go to the bar. No, that I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, after this, it'll cut back to... Um, them walking. Yeah, and probably... Uh, YouTube will, is more likely to get you on the audio than on the yeah. video. So I'll, I'll switch the audio back as soon as we get back to them. Uh, but yeah, here's the, here's the three brothers, which are really, well, can you minor. fast forward a little bit, just slightly maybe? Cause the, yeah. this is might be a, might be a little long scene. Okay. Here you go. So these are basically brothels. Okay, you can stop now. I mean, come back. Um, cool, go. I'm back. I'll, I'll switch my video too. Yeah. Okay, so um, watch the movie, but 
So that wasn't a perfect rendition of the ending, but it was it was good. Thank you for showing it. But I think the one thing I really wanted people to get, and you could see this more earlier, is the slow realization that he starts to get as he goes into this world. And it is a it's for us today. It's so hard for us, I think, to get some of these older um, things because just we're so inundated with entertainment and, and and like hard cutting brutal images, but like that there's a there's a laugh particularly this <laughs> it's a cackling and it's not a happy laugh i can't do it it's not a happy laugh um you have that woman there's two women on the on porches one of them is like this i mean she's not happy so there's a really and this is um a stylistic thing that these are all extended very you know the the architecture is very weird uh, some people have, you know, compared it to German expressionism, like the movie, if you watch the movie, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, where it's, it's like this horror show. And again, they're all, they're playing music, but they're, and they, it's like the sounds of happiness, but it's not happy, right? Like they are not happy. This is a horror show of a life that she lives in. The world she comes from is hell. I mean, they're basically going down and deeper and deeper into hell, and she's kind of at the bottom of Hades type thing. I mean, it's this really horrific vision of her life. And I just think that there's, um, you know, that that he kind of comes to that realization as he, as he goes, uh, as he goes down there. So it's not, so again, it's not that he doesn't or does care. It's more like a realization of, of him, uh, of what's going on with her life. And he does care in the sense that he loves her and he gen and, and he still loves her despite it in a sense or that, the, you know, he doesn't hate her because of it, but he, um, yeah. So, well, that's fair. And, and it, and it, perhaps it even strengthens his resolve to take her away. Now he's got even more of a reason to, to get her out of this. But well, it goes um, to the type of man he is, because even before he like he senses something's going on. And, and again, the acting people say John Wayne's not a good actor. I think this is a good example of him doing phenomenal acting. If you want, like he senses something's going on when they're walking, something's wrong. Now he's thinking about the brothers, but he's also thinking about her, the brothers he has to f possibly fight. Or is he going to fight them? That's the dilemma or run away and meet her at the meet his this girl at the ranch. There's a whole, but you know, but they the brothers now know that he's there, so he's gonna have to go to jail for a year. Um, is actually the so he starts to understand that I think, but before he realizes what she is yet, he has the line. I think he's it starts dawning on him a little bit. He has the line, um, "I'll never," you know, we we're not saying goodbye. You know, she said we should say goodbye here, and he says right. like we we ain't ever saying goodbye. And he grabs her by there. And I think that says something about his character, that he's made the decision. He's the, that's the type of man that he is. He's the ideal Westerner that we're going to see more and more in John Ford and other Westerns, that he's the, the man who makes a decision. He takes the action and he builds a family despite, you know, ter ter uh, terminal problems in his past. Right. Think about like an, an immigrant who's fleeing Europe, right, or, or the problems of the past. Both of these characters, the prostitute has a past. By the way, in the, the short story, her parents were murdered uh, by Indians, I believe, um, and, which is a common one you see in Westerns because it happened. <laughs> and uh, he, on the other hand, is, uh, you know, his brother was murdered uh, by an outlaw because there's no law. It's not even an outlaw. It's just that he was murdered because there's no law. It's the territories, right? right. There's, they don't have law yet. Um, and so this is part of the building of America. And this is that's what John Ford is trying to do. He's using yeah. the Bull de Suif, the Guy de Maupassant, you know, social criticism to ask a deeper question. And it's in the manners is what he I think um, John Ford gets out of this is how do they treat each other? This is a story about manners. Yeah, and it's it's almost as if he's he's telling Bull de Suif again, except for that he's giving the ending that perhaps he wished he had read, you know, you're it's, of course it's devastating when you read the existing ending in Boulder Sweep and you, you probably read it thinking, well, I would, I would want to rescue this girl. Or I, I'd want to um, treat her yeah. right and be like these other nine. And it's almost like John Ford read the short, 
felt that way and said, all right, I'm going to tell the story, but this time um, we're, we're going to save the girl. And it's also, and not to be, I, and I don't know how patriotic a guy John Ford was or anything like that. Very but it's patriotic. Well, most it, of the filmmakers at this time were very patriotic. And I, I could, I could buy it compared it to today. Like, <laughs> like, he, like he's saying like, well, if the same thing, if, if Bull to Sweep, if the same thing happened here, um, we Americans have, even though there's, even though we also have plenty of scum, just as is represented in Stagecoach and just as is represented in Bull to Sweep, we have what it takes. We have the kind of person who can overcome what the characters don't in Bull to Sweep. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it's yeah. like, it's, no, I think like, you're on the right track for 100%. Yeah. I mean, I think that's we, what he's trying to do consciously. Right. Yeah, it's, and, it's like it's 1939. There's World War Two going on. So you have yeah. fascists, you have socialists, you have communists. And it's like, what is America? And that's yeah. what he's asking. And, and that's what he's. And it's like, what bring this is why I like the genre of Westerns, yeah. because it asks that question. What is America? And because we're not we don't have like the French have thousands of years of history going yeah. back to the Roman times passing on to uh, Charlemagne and the first, you know, the Charlemagne, just like the Brits have um, um, the Excalibur stories. Uh, uh, King, King Arthur, thank you. That like yeah. King Arthur is a fable that comes out of this, you know, dark ages after the fall of the Roman Empire, where this is how they formed into Britain, right? Into different, and this is what unites them. French has Charlemagne. The Prussians have, whatever the Prussians have. Uh, I think they have Faust. It, it takes it takes them a little longer. What's that? Biz Otto von Bismarck, I think, at that time. Or, no, oh. but I'm talking about the story that unites them, right? They they have I, um, eventually they have like Goethe who does some stuff with them, but I'm not as familiar. But anyway, um, you know, with the heroes, they do have heroes literarily. But this is America doing the same thing. This yeah. is the American version of that. Yeah, and I I mean, reading it through that lens. I think having seen Stagecoach before Bull to Sweep, you could just feel like, hey, it's got a happy ending because Golden Age Hollywood was a generally optimistic and hopeful time in, in filmmaking and everything like that. But it almost feels like this movie should – like Bull to Sweep should be required reading yeah. so that you could really understand the um, the punch of the ending or the impact of – of Dallas not being rejected, but instead being accepted and loved by yeah. John Wayne. And you get these two uh, contrasting versions of like what happens at the end. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, it's, the the yeah. ending definitely means more with, with Bull to Sweep as, in, as, as the context for its basis. Well, and I, th and so we should probably wrap up here um, in a few minutes and, and I hope everybody will go see Bull to, or go read Bull to Sweep. It's not that long, you know, just buy the book of short stories uh, in translation if, if you don't read uh, French. And that's the one I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Word Words classic. Yeah. And uh, he's a great short story writer, uh, Guy de Maupassant. And watch Stagecoach. Watch it a couple of times. It's a really good story. Um, I mean, there's so much to talk about. Like, the, this, we didn't even talk about the beginning. We didn't talk about each, you know, the, their actual carriage rides. We didn't talk about Monument Valley. You know, this is the cinema is such important. And then we didn't talk about that the U.S. Calvary were played the stunt guys. And the stunts in this are phenomenal for 1939 and for any time. I mean, it's horrifying to know that they all the people who are doing the stunts in this movie did the stuff you see. So, and it's when you watch it, oh, my God, that guy did that. Uh, the yeah. horses are actually collapsed. They're taught. There's no tripwires. They're doing it themselves, as far as I understand. Um, Can I play any of that while you're talking about it? Um. I know that you oh. want to keep the, the amount of footage. Well, no, it's more about time. We're getting pretty long here. I'm mean, I going to say like, well, let's maybe we'll do something in the future. The two of us, I think you and I are great on this. We should, I'd love to have more stuff with you for sure. Yeah. Um, we could definitely do a, yeah. Another, um, e even if we, even if we did other films, we, we could, we could still talk stage codes if, if we stuck in the Western genre. Um, yeah. I think like maybe we could do 1939 or something like that one day. Um, that'd be cool. And, and do like, you know, three or four movies and just kind of talk about them for an hour or two. But yeah, so I think, um, anyway, so, so all that stuff is going on. 
watch Stagecoach. There's so much stuff to watch there. Watch or read Bull to Sweep. And I love that you say it should be required reading. Definitely should be um, for, you know, because it will enhance your experience of great art. And John Ford is an artist. This is art. And, you know, when you want, you know, it's, it's art because he's, it's not, again, it's what separates art from history. It's not actually a historical representation. He's trying to create something new with the materials from the world as he knows it. And I think that's part of the essence of good art. So any last words, Chris, before we leave? No, I dig it. I, I appreciate the time. I, um, I don't read enough. And, uh, and you, you know, you pointed out uh, about John Ford being, um, so it's, it's nice to have this. It's nice to have sessions like this that kind of keep me disciplined. Um, and you talk about John, John Ford being, um, you know, very, as literate as he was. And it's, of course, he would not have grown up with movies. Uh, if he wanted stories, he grew up having to read them yeah. and, uh, you know, we're a Good different point. generation and, and, you know, we consume way more stories that way, but it is nice. This, this definitely helps the understanding of, of the movie and, um, and, uh, certainly enhances my appreciation of it. So ton, definitely tons of fun for me. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for tuning into Tubidor Talks and I'll see you next week.